Marcus Tullius Cicero, On the Nature of the Gods. Chapter 6 Now, to free myself from the reproach of partiality, I propose to lay before you the opinions of various philosophers concerning the nature of the gods, by which means all men may judge which of them are consistent with truth. And if all agree together, or if any one shall be found to have discovered what may be absolutely called truth, I will then give up the academy as vain and arrogant. So I may cry out in the words of Statius and the Cenefevi, Ye gods, I call upon, require, pray, beseech, entreat, and implore the attention of my countrymen all, both young and old. Yet not on so trifling an occasion as when the person in the play complains that, In this city we have discovered a most flagrant iniquity. Here is a professed courtesan who refuses money from her lover. But that they may attend, know, and consider what sentiments they ought to preserve concerning religion, piety, sanctity, ceremonies, faith, oaths, temples, shrines, and solemn sacrifices. What they ought to think of the auspices over which I preside. For all these have relation to the present question. The manifest disagreement among the most learned on the subject creates doubts in those who imagine they have some certain knowledge of the subject. Which fact I have often taken notice of elsewhere, and I did so more especially at the discussion that was held at my friend C. Cotta's concerning the immortal gods, and which was carried on with the greatest care, accuracy, and precision. For coming to him at the time of the Latin holidays, according to his own invitation and message from him, I found him sitting in his study and in a discourse with C. Valeus, the senator, who was then reputed by the Epicureans, the ablest of our countrymen. Q. Lucilius Balbus was likewise there, a great proficient in the doctrine of the Stoics, and esteemed equal to the most eminent of the Greeks in that part of knowledge. As soon as Cotta saw me, You are come, says he, very seasonably, for I am having a dispute with Valeus on an important subject, which, considering the nature of your studies, is not improper for you to join in. Chapter 7 Indeed, says I, I think I am come very seasonably, as you say, for there are three chiefs of three principal sects met together. If M. Piso is present, no sect of philosophy that's in any esteem would want an advocate. If Antiochus's book, replies Cotta, which he lately sent to Balbus, says true, you have no occasion to wish for your friend Piso, for Antiochus is of the opinion that the Stoics don't differ from the Peripatetics in fact, though they do in words. And I should be glad to know what you think of that book, Balbus. I, says he, I wonder that Antiochus, a man of the clearest apprehension, should not see what a vast difference there is between the Stoics who distinguish the honest and the profitable, not only in name but absolutely in kind, and the Peripatetics who blend the honest with the profitable in such a manner that they differ only in degrees, with proportion, and not in kind. This is not a little difference in words, but a great one in things. But of this hereafter. Now, if you think fit, let us return to what we began with. With all my heart, says Cotta, but that this visitor, looking on me, who has just come in, may not be ignorant of what we're upon, I will inform him that we were discoursing on the nature of the gods, concerning which, as it is a subject that always appeared very obscure to me, I prevailed on Valeus to give us the sentiments of Epicurus. Therefore, continues he, if it is not troublesome, Valeus, repeat what you have already stated to us. I will, says he, though this newcomer will be no advocate for me, but for you. For you have both, adds he with a smile, learned from the same Philo to be certain of nothing. What we have learned from him, replied I, Cotta will discover, but I would not have you think that I am come as an assistant to him, but as an auditor, with an impartial and unbiased mind and not bound by any obligation to defend any particular principle, whether I like or dislike it. Chapter 8 After this, Valeus, with the confidence peculiar to his sect, dreading nothing so much as to seem to doubt of anything, began as if he just then descended from the council of the gods, and Epicurus's intervals of worlds. Do not attend, says he, to these idle and imaginary tales, nor to the operator and builder of the world, the god of Plato's Timaeus, nor to the old prophetic dame, the pronoia of the Stoics, which the Latins call providence, nor to that round, that burning, revolving deity, the world, endowed with sense and understanding, the prodigies and wonders, not of inquisitive philosophers, but of dreamers. For with what eyes of the mind was your Plato able to see that workhouse of such stupendous toil, in which he makes the world to be modeled and built by God? 
What materials, what tools, what bars, what machines, what servants were employed in so vast a work? How could the air, fire, water, and earth pay obedience and submit to the will of the architect? From whence arose those five forms of which the rest were composed, so aptly contributing to frame the mind and produce the senses? It's tedious to go through all, as they are all of such a sort that they look more like things to be desired than to be discovered. But what is more remarkable, he gives us a world which has been not only created, but, if I may say so, in a manner formed with hands, and yet he says it's eternal. Do you conceive him to have the least skill in natural philosophy who is capable of thinking anything to be everlasting that had a beginning? For what can possibly ever have been put together which cannot be dissolved again? Or what is there that had a beginning which will not have an end? If your providence, Lucilius, is the same as Plato's God, I ask you, as before, who were the assistants? What were the engines? What was the plan and preparation of the whole work? If it is not the same, then why did she make the world mortal and not everlasting, like Plato's God? Chapter 9 But I would demand of you both, why these world builders started up so suddenly, and lay dormant for so many ages? We are not to conclude that, if there was no world, there were therefore no ages. I do not now speak of such ages as are finished by a certain number of days and nights and annual courses, for I acknowledge that those couldn't be without the revolution of the world. But there was a certain eternity from infinite time, not measured by any circumscription of seasons, but how that was in space we cannot understand, because we cannot possibly have even the slightest idea of time before time was. I desire therefore to know, Baldus, why this providence of yours was idle for such an immense space of time. Did she avoid labor? But that could have no effect on the deity, nor could there be any labor, since all nature, air, fire, earth, and water would obey the divine essence. What was it that incited the deity to act the part of an aedile to illumine and decorate the world? If it was in order that God might be the better accommodated in his habitation, then he must have been dwelling an infinite length of time before in darkness as in a dungeon. But do we imagine that he was afterward delighted with that variety with which we see the heaven and earth adorned? What entertainment could that be to the deity? If it was any, he would not have been without it so long. Or were these things made, as you almost assert, by God for the sake of men? Was it for the wise? Well, if so, then this great design was adopted for the sake of a very small number. Or for the sake of fools? First of all, there was no reason why God should consult the advantage of the wicked. And further, what could be his object in doing so? Since all fools are, without doubt, the most miserable of men, chiefly because they are fools. For what can we pronounce more deplorable than folly? Besides, there are many inconveniences in life which the wise can learn to think lightly of by dwelling rather on advantages which they receive, but which fools are unable to avoid when they are coming, or to bear when they are come. Chapter 10 They who affirm the world to be an animated and intelligent being have by no means discovered the nature of the mind, nor are able to conceive in what form that essence might consist. But of that I shall speak more hereafter. At present I must express my surprise at the weakness of those who endeavor to make it out, to be not only animated and immortal, but likewise happy and round, because Plato says that that's the most beautiful form, whereas I think a cylinder, a square, a cone, or a pyramid more beautiful. But what life do they attribute to that round deity? Truly, it's a being whirled about with a celerity to which nothing can ever be conceived by the imagination as equal, nor can I imagine how a settled mind and a happy life can consist in such a motion, the least degree of which would be troublesome to us. Why, therefore, should it not be considered troublesome also to the deity? For the earth itself, as it is part of the world, is part also of the deity. We see vast tracts of land, barren and uninhabitable, some because they are scorched by the too near approach of the sun, others because they are bound up with frost and snow, through the great distance which the sun is from them. Therefore, if the world's a deity... As these are parts of the world, some of the deity's limbs must be said to be scorched and some frozen. These are your doctrines, Lucilius, but what those of others are I will endeavor to ascertain by tracing them back from the earliest of the ancient philosophers. Thales, the Milesian, who first inquired after such subjects, asserted water to be the origin of all things, and that God was that mind which formed all things of water. If the gods can exist without corporeal sense, and if there could be a mind without a body, why did he annex a mind to water? 
It was Anaximander's opinion that the gods were born, that after a great length of time they died, and that they are innumerable worlds. But what conception can we possibly have of a deity who is not eternal? Anaximenes, after him, taught that the air is God, and that he was generated, and that he is immense, infinite, and always in motion, as if air, which has no form, could possibly be God, for the deity must necessarily be not only of some form or other, but of the most beautiful form. Besides, is not everything that had a beginning subject to mortality? Chapter 11 Anaxagoras, who received his learning from Anaximenes, was the first to affirm the system and disposition of all things to be contrived and perfected by the power and reason of an infinite mind, in which infinity he did not perceive that there could be no conjunction of sense and motion, nor any sense in the least degree, where nature herself could feel no impulse. If he would have this mind to be a sort of animal, then there must be some more internal principle from whence that animal should receive its appellation. But what can be more internal than the mind? Let it, therefore, be clothed with an external body. But this is not agreeable to his doctrine. But we are utterly unable to conceive how a pure, simple mind can exist without any substance annexed to it. Alcmaeon of Cretana, in attributing a divinity to the sun, the moon, and the rest of the stars, and also to the mind, did not perceive that he was ascribing immortality to mortal beings. Pythagoras, who supposed the deity to be one soul, mixing with and pervading all nature, from which our souls are taken, did not consider that the deity himself must, in consequence of this doctrine, be maimed and torn with the rending of every human soul from it, nor that, when the human mind is afflicted, as is the case in many instances, that part of the deity must likewise be afflicted, which cannot be. If the human mind were a deity, how could it be ignorant of anything? Besides, how could that deity, if it's nothing but a soul, be mixed with, or infused into, the world? Then, Xenophanes, who said that everything in the world which had any existence, with the addition of intellect, was God, is as liable to exception as the rest, especially in relation to the infinity of it, in which there can be nothing sentient, nothing composite. Parmenides formed a conceit to himself of something circular like a crown. He names it Stephanie. It's an orb of constant light and heat around the heavens. This he calls God, in which there is no room to imagine any divine form or sense. And he uttered many other absurdities on the same subject, for he ascribed a divinity to war, to discord, to lust, and other passions of the same kind which are destroyed by disease or sleep or oblivion or age. The same honor he gives to the stars, but I shall forbear making any objections to his system here, having already done it in another place. Chapter 12. Empedocles, who erred in many things, is most grossly mistaken in his notion of the gods. He lays down four natures as divine, from which he thinks that all things were made. Yet it is evident that they have a beginning, that they decay, and that they are void of all sense. Protagoras did not seem to have any idea of the real nature of the gods, for he acknowledged that he was altogether ignorant whether there are or are not any, or what they are. What shall I say of Democritus, who classes our images of objects and their orbs in the number of the gods, as he does that principle through which those images appear and have their influence? He deifies likewise our knowledge and understanding. Is he not involved in a very great error? And because nothing continues always in the same state, he denies that anything is everlasting. Does he not thereby entirely destroy the deity and make it impossible to form any opinion of him? Diogenes of Apollonia looks upon the air to be a deity, but what sense can the air have, or what divine form can be attributed to it? It would be tedious to show the uncertainty of Plato's opinion, for in his Timaeus he denies the propriety of asserting that there is one great father or creator of the world, and in his book of laws he thinks we ought not to make too strict an inquiry into the nature of the deity. And as for a statement when he asserts that God is a being without any body, what the Greeks call esomatos, it is certainly quite unintelligible how that theory can possibly be true, for such a god must then be necessarily destitute of sense, prudence, and pleasure, all which things are comprehended in our notion of the gods. He likewise asserts in his Timaeus and in his laws that the world, the heavens, the stars, the mind, and those gods which are delivered down to us from our ancestors constitute the deity. These opinions, taken separately, are apparently false, and together are directly inconsistent with each other. 
Xenophon has committed almost the same mistakes, but in fewer words. In those sayings which he is related to Socrates, he introduces him disputing the lawfulness of inquiring into the form of the deity, and makes him assert the sun and the mind to be deities. He represents him likewise as affirming the being of one God only, and at another time of many, which are errors of almost the same kind which I before took notice of in Plato. Chapter 13 Antisthenes, in his book, called The Natural Philosopher, says that there are many national and one natural deity. But by this saying, he destroys the power and nature of the gods. Speusippus is not much less in the wrong, who, following his uncle, Plato, says that a certain incorporeal power governs everything, by which he endeavors to root out of our minds the knowledge of the gods. Aristotle, in his third book of philosophy, confounds many things together, as the rest have done, but he does not differ from his master, Plato. At one time he attributes all divinity to the mind. At another he asserts that the world is God. Soon afterward he makes some other essence preside over the world, and gives it those faculties by which, with certain revolutions, he may govern and preserve the motion of it. Then he asserts the heat of the firmament to be God, not perceiving the firmament to be part of the world, which in another place he had described as God. How can that divine sense of the firmament be preserved in so rapid a motion? And where do the multitude of gods dwell, if heaven itself is a deity? But when this philosopher says that God is without a body, he makes him an irrational and insensible being. Besides, how can the world move itself, if it wants a body? Or how, if it isn't perpetual self-motion, can it be easy and happy? Xenocrates, his fellow pupil, does not appear much wiser on this head, for in his books concerning the nature of the gods, no divine form is described, but he says the number of them is eight. Five removing planets, the sixth is contained in all the fixed stars, which dispersed are so many several members, but considered together are one single deity. The seventh is the sun, and the eighth the moon. But in what sense they can possibly be happy is not easy to be understood. From the same school of Plato, Heraclides of Pontus stuffed his book with puerile tales. Sometimes he thinks the world a deity, at other times the mind. He attributes divinity likewise to the wandering stars. He deprives the deity of sense and makes his form mutable. And in the same book again, he makes earth and heaven deities. The unsteadiness of Theophrastus is equally intolerable. At one time, he attributes a divine prerogative to the mind. At another, to the firmament. At another, to the stars and celestial constellations. Nor is his disciple Strato, who is called the naturalist, any more worthy to be regarded, for he thinks that the divine power is diffused through nature, which is the cause of birth, increase, and diminution, but that it has no sense or form. Chapter 14 Zeno, to come to your sect, Balbus, thinks the law of nature to be the divinity, and that it has the power to force us to do what is right, and to restrain us from what is wrong. How this law can be an animated being I cannot conceive, but that God is so, we would certainly maintain. The same person says, in another place, that the sky is God. But can we possibly conceive that God is a being insensible, deaf to our prayers, our wishes, and our vows, and wholly unconnected with us? In other books, he thinks there's a certain rational essence pervading all nature, endued with divine efficacy. He attributes the same power to the stars, to the years, to the months, and to the seasons. In his interpretation of Hesiod's Theogony, he entirely destroys the established notions of the gods, for he excludes Jupiter, Juno, and Vesta. And those esteem divine from the number of them, but his doctrine is that these are names by which some kind of allusion are given to mute and inanimate beings. The sentiments of his disciple Aristo are not less erroneous. He thought it impossible to conceive the form of the deity, and asserts that the gods are destitute of sense, and he is entirely dubious whether the deity is an animated being or not. Cleanthes, who next comes under my notice, a disciple of Zeno, at the same time with Aristo, in one place says that the world is God, in another he attributes divinity to the mind and spirit of universal nature. Then he asserts that the most remote, the highest, the all-surrounding, the all-enclosing and embracing heat, which is called the sky, is most certainly the deity. In the books he wrote against pleasure, in which he seems to be raving, he imagines the gods to have a certain form and shape. Then he ascribes all divinity to the stars. And lastly, he thinks nothing more divine than reason. So that this God, whom we know mentally, and in the speculations of our minds, from which traces we receive our impression, has at last actually no visible form at all. Chapter 15 Perseus, another disciple of Zeno, says that they who have made discoveries advantageous to the life of man should be esteemed as gods. 
And the very things, he says, which are healthful and beneficial have derived their names from those of the gods, so that he thinks it not sufficient to call them the discoveries of gods, but he urges that they themselves should be deemed divine. What can be more absurd than to ascribe divine honors to sordid and deformed things, or to place among the gods men who are dead and mixed with the dust, to whose memory all the respect that could be paid would be but mourning for their loss? Chrysippus, who is looked upon as the most subtle interpreter of the dreams of the Stoics, has mustered up a numerous band of unknown gods, and so unknown that we are not able to form any idea about them, though our mind seems capable of framing any image to itself in its thoughts. For he says that the divine power is placed in reason, and in the spirit and mind of universal nature, that the world, with a universal effusion of its spirit, is God, that the superior part of that spirit, which is the mind and reason, is the great principle of nature, containing and preserving the chain of all things, that the divinity is the power of fate and the necessity of future events. He deifies fire also, and what I before called the ethereal spirit and those elements which naturally proceed from it, water, earth, and air. He attributes divinity to the sun, moon, stars, and universal space, the grand container of all things, and to those men likewise who have obtained immortality. He maintains the sky to be what men call Jupiter, the air which pervades the sea to be Neptune, and the earth, Ceres. In like manner he goes through the names of the other deities. He says that Jupiter is that immutable and eternal law which guides and directs us in our manners. In this he calls fatal necessity the everlasting verity of future events. But none of these are of such a nature as to seem to carry any indication of divine virtue in them. These are the doctrines contained in his first book of the nature of the gods. In the second, he endeavors to accommodate the fables of Orpheus, Musaeus, Hesiod, and Homer. To what he has advanced in the first, in order that the most ancient poets, who never dreamed of these things, may seem to have been Stoics. Diogenes the Babylonian was a follower of the doctrine of Chrysippus, and in that book which he wrote, entitled A Treatise Concerning Minerva, he separates the account of Jupiter's bringing forth and the birth of that virgin from the fabulous and reduces it to a natural construction. Chapter 16 Thus far I've been rather exposing the dreams of daughters rather than giving the opinions of philosophers. Not much more absurd than these are the fables of the poets who owe all their power of doing harm to the sweetness of their language, who've represented the gods as enraged with anger and inflamed with lust, who've brought before our eyes their wars, battles, combats, wounds, their hatreds, dissensions, discords, births, deaths, complaints, and lamentations, their indulgences in all kinds of intemperance, their adulteries, their chains, their amours with mortals, and mortals begotten by immortals. To these idle and ridiculous flights of the poets, we may add the prodigious stories invented by the Magi, and by the Egyptians also, which were of the same nature, together with the extravagant notions of the multitude at all times, who from total ignorance of the truth are always fluctuating in uncertainty. Now whoever reflects on the rashness and absurdity of these tenets must inevitably entertain the highest respect and veneration for Epicurus, and perhaps even rank him in the number of those beings who are the subject of this dispute, for he alone first founded the idea of the existence of the gods on the impression which nature herself hath made on the minds of all men. For what nation, what people are there, who have not, without any learning, a natural idea, or pre-notion, of a deity? Epicurus calls this prolipsis, that is, an antecedent conception of the fact in the mind, without which nothing can be understood, inquired after, or discoursed on. The force and advantage of which reasoning we receive from that celestial volume of Epicurus concerning the rule and judgment of things.